Okay, so today we'll be discussing the so-called negotiable instruments of the Philippines or what is known as Act Number 2031. Before we'll consider the different sections on these negotiable instruments law, allow me to give you a brief background on the history of these negotiable instruments law. This negotiable instruments law did not really originate from our country. We just copied it from another country. And where do you think would it be? Well, we copied it, we patterned it from the negotiable instruments law of the United States of America. But where did the United States also copy the same? Well, the United States of America copied it from the Bills of Exchange Act of England. The year then was 1884, and in England, there were several laws pertaining to the law on merchants. So where, what did they do? They codified all those laws, and thereafter, they called it as the Bills of Exchange Act of England. And from then on, the United States copied it, and in 1911, you heard it right, 1911, the Philippines copied it from the United States, and we call it now as the Negotiable Instruments Law of the Philippines. Our Act Number 2031, or the Negotiable Instruments Law of the Philippines, was enacted sometime February 3 of 1911. So if it was enacted on February 3 of 1911, when is the date of its effectivity? The law provides that it shall take effect 90 days following the completion of its publication in the official gazette. So to be able to know the date of its effectivity, you have to know also when was the last day of its publication. Well, the publication was completed on March 4 of 1911. Thus, it becomes effective on June 2 of 1911. Okay? You have to remember that this negotiable instruments law of the Philippines was its purpose of its creation. Ano ba yung purpose niya? Well, the purpose of its creation is that this negotiable instruments law was created or enacted for the purpose of facilitating, not hindering or hampering transactions in commercial paper. So it will facilitate, it will help commercial transactions. That is the ruling of the Supreme Court in the case of Osmania versus Citibank, 426 Iskra 159. So that is, ladies and gentlemen, the brief history of the negotiable instruments of the Philippines, that it did not really originate from our country, that we merely copied it from another country, from the United States. But the United States merely copied it also from another country, from England. So that's the evolution of the negotiable instruments of the Philippines. And the date of its effectivity is June 2 of 1911. So it's more than a century old law. Okay? So more than a century old You might be wondering what's the relevance of this dinosaur in the slide. Well, being a century old law, then this is now considered a Jurassic law. It's one of the oldest laws that's being considered in our school. So with that, we can now consider the functions of negotiable instruments law. What are the functions of negotiable instruments? There are two notable functions of negotiable instruments. The first one is that it increases the medium of currency in circulation. And the other is it is considered as a substitute for money. So how will it increase the medium of currency in circulation? You imagine that in the Philippines, the total amount of money that's circulating right now, okay, for purposes of example only, is only 1 trillion pesos. That already includes the bills as well as the coins printed and minted by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. How about if out of the 1 trillion money that's circulating in the Philippines, you only have with you 100,000? So ganun lang karami yung pera mo dun. 
considering that you only have 100,000, would it be possible for you to acquire a property worth 1 million when in fact your money is only 100,000? The answer would be yes. How? Through the issuance of what we call now as a negotiable instrument. In so far as your balance of 900,000, you could actually be issuing a check to cover the 900,000 or you could be using a promissory note or a bill of exchange to cover your balance of 900,000. So assuming that the vendor has allowed you to issue a promissory note to cover your balance of 900,000, what will happen now to the total amount of money now circulating in the Philippines? So initially, we have 1 trillion and you have 100,000 out of the 1 trillion. Since you have issued a check or a promissory note for the remaining, for your balance of 900,000, then the total medium of currency now circulation in circulation in the Philippines would have been increased by another 900,000. So what is now the distinction between the 1 trillion pesos originally circulated in the Philippines and the additional 900,000 because of the issuance of that negotiable instrument? Well, there is a big disparity between the two. In so far as the 1 trillion pesos is concerned, the 1 trillion is actually supported with, or it's actually being guaranteed, and it's actually being supported with gold and silver by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Whereas, your 900,000 is merely secured by your promise to pay, as the same is merely covered by your promise or no. That's the first function of negotiable instrument. It increases the medium of currency in circulation. How about the second one? Insofar as the second function of negotiable instruments is concerned, it is considered as a substitute for money. But mind you, although a negotiable instrument is considered as a substitute for money, you have to remember that it is not legal tender. So as of this early, I want to remind you that a negotiable instrument is never a legal tender. So what is legal tender again? Legal tender refers to a kind of currency which a debtor can compel a creditor to receive as payment of an obligation in money. And in the Philippines, our legal tender is the Philippine peso. Kind of currency which a debtor can compel a creditor to receive as payment of an obligation in money. Kung may utang ka, yun ang gagamitin mo na pambayad. Kung ayaw tanggapin ng creditor mo, as long as it is complete, as long as it is a full payment, then you can go to court in order to compel your creditor to receive that payment. You could actually deposit that even in court in order to constitute payment. Consignation or consignment, remember that, as a special form of payment. However, when it comes to negotiable instrument, although it will be considered as a substitute for money, although it will help you to facilitate commercial transactions, that negotiable instrument, whether it is a promissory note or a, negotiable or a bill of exchange or a check, whether a personal check, a manager's check or a cashier's check, nonetheless, it is not yet considered legal tender. So if your creditor will refuse to receive your check as payment of your indebtedness or your obligation or as payment of what you have purchased, you cannot go to court in, om in order to compel your creditor or the seller to receive it as payment. Why is that? Because that negotiable instrument is not legal tender, though substitute for money. Going on further, what is a negotiable instrument? Well, it has been defined that a negotiable instrument refers to a written contract for the payment of money by which, by its form and on its face, is intended as a substitute for money. And just like money, it is allowed to pass from one hand to another so as to give the holder in due course the right to hold the instrument and later on to demand payment of the face value of that instrument. So it is clear that a negotiable instrument is written. It is in writing. Thus, there is no possibility that you will be issuing 
an oral or a verbal negotiable instrument. Because when we say instrument, it connotes that it must be written. And it should be for the payment of money and not for the rendition of any other obligation besides the payment of money. Later on, you would learn that if you would be required to perform any additional act besides the payment of money, that instrument will be rendered non-negotiable. And that instrument is intended to be passed from one person to another since its function is that it will act as a substitute for money. That is now the concept of negotiability, that the instrument is capable of being transferred from one person to another. And if you are considered as a holder in due course, a person who has received it or so on to the requirements of being a holder in due course, then you can demand full payment of the face value thereof. So that is negotiable instrument. Going on further, what are the characteristics of a negotiable instrument? A negotiable instrument has the following characteristics. First, it is negotiability. And the second is that it involves the accumulation of secondary contracts. Remember, if your instrument is negotiable, remember if your instrument has complied with the essential requisites as provided in Section 1 of Act Number 2031, then the instrument is negotiable. So, negotiability, what's the meaning of that? That's one of the uh, features of that negotiable instrument. And what is negotiability? Negotiation, to negotiate. Negotiation or to negotiate means it refers to the transfer of that instrument, complete in form and substance, from one person to another in order to constitute the transfer, the holder thereof. Simply stated, when the instrument is negotiable, it is capable of being transferred from one person to another. It passes from one hand to another as a substitute for money. However, Remember, only a negotiable instrument will possess that type of characteristic. And how would I know whether or not my instrument is negotiable? The instrument is said to be negotiable if it has complied with the essential requisites of a negotiable instrument as provided in Section 1 of the Negotiable Instruments Law. As long as it will, form, as long as it will comply with those five requirements, that it must be in writing and signed by the maker or drawer, that it must contain an unconditional promise to pay a sum certain in money, that it must be payable on demand or at a fixed or at a determinable future time, that it must be payable to order or bearer, or, and that if it is a bill of exchange, then the drawing must be named or otherwise indicated therein with reasonable certainty. As long as those five requirements are present, then you are certain that you have a negotiable instrument. And if it is a negotiable instrument, then it can be passed from one person to another. Another characteristic of a negotiable instrument is that there will be accumulation of secondary contracts. Well, the second characteristic of our negotiable instrument is actually interrelated with the first one. Why is that? Because I have mentioned to you a while ago, that when your instrument is negotiable, then it can be passed from one hand to another as if it is substitute for money. In the process of changing of hands, in the process of negotiating your instrument, then there will now be the accumulation of secondary contracts. Let's illustrate using the following. Promissory note, because it says here a maker. So maker will transfer that to the payee, P, and P later on will transfer that to A, our endorsee. Okay, so P, our maker, now M, our maker, would issue that later on to P. P, after holding that instrument, he will e deliver that to A. That's what we call now as endorsement. That's negotiation. A to B. B to C, C to D, D to E. Okay. So where is our primary contract? Remember, 
it involves only the accumulation of secondary contract. So where is our primary contract? Our primary contract is between our maker and our pay. So if ever M will issue that instrument to P. So the first delivery of the instrument is known as issuance. So maker to P, that is not yet the secondary contract. That is the first contract. That is our primary contract. So if P now, the pay, we later on transfer that to A, that is the first negotiation. That is the first secondary contract. When A would later on negotiate that again to B, that is our second secondary contract. B to C, that is the third secondary contract. C to D, that's the fourth secondary contract. D to E, that's the fifth secondary contract. So, the more negotiations that you will undertake, the more transfers that you will make, the more secondary contracts that will be created. Okay? So, going on further. Okay? So, the transfer between the maker and the payee is what we call the primary contract. The transfer from the payee P to A, A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E are what we call now as negotiations. And negotiations are what we call as our secondary contract. Thus, it says here that if P will transfer that to A, that's the first, A to B, that's the second, B to C, that's the third, and so on and so forth. What are the different kinds of negotiable instruments that we are going to encounter in our study of the negotiable instruments law? Well, we will only be discussing the principal or the primary uh, kinds and we have our promissory note. Next would be our bill of exchange. And then the third one would be what we call as our check. Might be wondering, what is a promissory note? A promissory note refers to an unconditional promise in writing by one person to another, signed by a person known as the maker, engaging to pay on demand or at a fixed or determinable future time, as I'm certain in money, or it's equivalent to order or to better. The most notable thing that you have to remember when it comes to promissory note is that there must be a promise to pay. And the promise to pay must be unconditional. It should not be dependent upon the happening of an event which may or may not happen. And it should always be for the payment of money and not for the performance of any other obligation. And you have to pay that, you have to deliver that to an order of the pay or to the bearer of the pay. How about a bill of exchange? If a promissory note contains an unconditional promise to pay, a bill of exchange contains an unconditional order made by our drawer, addressed to a person known as a drawee, requiring the drawee to pay on demand or at a fixed or at a determinable future time a sum certain in money to order or to better. So how will you now distinguish a promissory note from a bill of exchange? In a promissory note, the maker himself will be the one to pay because he's the one giving the unconditional promise to pay. Whereas in a bill of exchange, the person who prepared the bill of exchange known as the drawer is not the one who will deliver the payment to the pay or to the order of the pay or to the bearer of the pay or to the bearer of the instrument, I should say. Rather, our drawer in a bill of exchange is just the one giving the command to pay, giving the unconditional order to pay. So who is being ordered to pay here? The one being ordered to pay is known as a drawee. And later you would learn that if the drawee will now accede to the command or to the order of our drawer to pay, he will have a conversion and he will now be known as the acceptor of the instrument. So if you would be asked, who would pay then the bill of exchange? It is the person known as the acceptor. And who is the acceptor? He is the drawee. The person being commanded, being directed, being mandated, being ordered by the drawer to pay. And why did he become the acceptor? Because he acceded. He consented 
to the order of our drawer to deliver the payment. If he did not give his consent, if he did not accept the order, he remains as a drawee, and as a drawee, he has no liability in the instrument. Remember that. If our drawee did not accede to the unconditional order of the drawer to pay, the drawee has no liability. His liability will attach only if ever he gives his conformity to the order of our drawer. There is also another kind of negotiable instrument. There is, that is what we call as a check. And what's a check? Check is in reality a classification of a bill of exchange that's a drawn on a bank, payable on demand. So how will I distinguish check from a bill of exchange? Well, if the drawee is a bank, then you are certain that it is a check. But if the drawee is a person, then that is a natural person, then that is considered a bill of exchange. Going on further, let's look at an illustration of a promissory note. Okay? So in this case, in this illustration, we have said a while ago that promissory note contains an unconditional promise to pay. So where is the promise here? There is the this is the promise to pay. Is it conditional? Obviously, it is unconditional because the promise made by Mike, our maker, does not depend upon any event which may or may not happen. It simply stated that he promised to pay Peter or order the amount of one million. So let's try to digest it first. Mike is known as the maker, the person who prepared the promissory note. Peter is known as the pay, the person in whose favor this instrument was made. Order refers to any person to whom Peter will transfer later the instrument. So it could be X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, etc. One million is the sum certain in money. And the word promise here is the unconditional promise or the unconditional undertaking to deliver the payment to Peter or to the transfer of Peter. So that is our illustration on what we call as a promise or not. Going on further, let's also try to consider an illustration of a bill of exchange. Remember what we have mentioned a while ago. A bill of exchange refers to an unconditional order to pay made by our drawer, directed or addressed to a drawee for the payment of a sum certain in money to a payee or to the order of a pay or to the bearer of that instrument. So let's first try to consider who are the parties here. Who is Danny? Danny is the one who prepared our bill of exchange. So Danny is known as our drawer. How about Allen? Allen is the person being ordered by Danny to pay the instrument. So Allen is known as the drawee, the person being ordered, being directed, being mandated by Danny to pay the instrument. How about Peter? Peter here is the pay of our bill of exchange. The person in whose favor this bill of exchange has been made. Now, order the transfer of Peter. And then 1 million is the sum certain in money. We have mentioned a while ago that in a bill of exchange, there is an unconditional order to pay. Where is the command to pay? Where is the order to pay? Where is the mandate to pay? Well, this word, pay, magbayad ka. Is it dependent upon a condition? Meron bang choice si Allen? Kung hindi magbayad lamang? Sinabi niya, Allen, bayaran mo si Peter ng isang million. That is a mandate to pay. That is an unconditional order to pay. So take note, just like what I've said a while ago, in a bill of exchange, the person who prepared it, Danny, is not the one who will deliver the payment to Peter. Rather, the payment will be made by Allen in favor of Peter. Why is that? Because Danny is giving a command to Allen. Sabi niya, oh, Allen, bayaran mo si Peter ng isang million. That is unconditional order to pay. 
Pero meron akong sinabi kanina. Ano yon? That Allen initially is known as a drawing, the person being commanded to pay. Before the liability of Allen will attach, before he will be required to pay Peter the amount of 1 million, ano ang requirement? Dapat merong acceptance. That Allen must first give his conformity to the order of Danny to pay. If he will reject that command of Danny to pay, then he remains as a drawing. And anong sinabi ko? If he remains as a drawing, if he will not accept the order of Danny to pay, he has no liability on the instrument. Why is that? Because a drawing is a person who has no liability. He is not liable until such time that he will accept the unconditional order of the drawer to pay the pay or the order of the pay or the bearer of that bill of exchange. Illustration of a check. Take note. Similarly worded with our bill of exchange. But what's the difference? If you notice, our payee here, our drawee here, is no longer Allen. It is already a bank. Because a check is a bill of exchange that is always drawn on a bank. And in our illustration, we have made use of Philippine National Bank as the drawee of the instrument. So, we are certain that it is a check. So, our discussion here will, send, will start from birth of the instrument up to the death of our instrument. So, what are the incidents? in the life of a negotiable instrument. So our approach is what we call as the spiraling process. We will be jumping from one topic to another as long as that particular topic is related to what is being discussed at hand. Then we will go to that topic. We will go to that section even if it's found on a later portion. So what are the incidents in the life of a negotiable instrument? There are at least 10. The first one is issue. The first delivery of the instrument. Next would be negotiation. So after the issuance, there will be negotiation. That's what we call now as the transfer of the instrument from one person to another in order to constitute the transfer of the holder thereof. Then there is presentment for acceptance, which is applicable only to a bill of exchange because only a bill of exchange needs to be presented for acceptance. Then there is acceptance. This is now the process by which our drawee gives his conformity to the unconditional order of the drawer. Then there is this honor ban and acceptance. Three, four, five is applicable only to a bill of exchange. Number six would be presentment for payment. This is applicable to both promissory note and a bill of exchange. Then there is this honor ban and payment. So assuming that you have presented your instrument and it has not been uh, for payment and it was not accepted, uh, it was not paid, then you, could now, you can now consider our instrument dishonored by non payment. And then notice of dishonor. This is the process of informing parties secondarily liable that an instrument, when presented for payment or for acceptance, the same was dishonored. And then you have protest in certain cases. Why, why is it certain cases only? Because this is applicable only to what we call as a foreign bill of exchange. It does not apply to domestic or inland bill of exchange. And then finally, the discharge or the death of the instrument. So remember... This is what we're going to follow. This is our map in our discussion about the negotiable instruments. We'll start from the issuance or from the birth and then up to the death or up to the time that the instrument is discharged. So module two, unit one, we will now formally start our discussion on the requisites of negotiable instrument. Okay, the requisites of negotiability. So you have to take note of this as uh, if an instrument will be able to comply with these requirements, then you are certain that you have a negotiable instrument. So there are only five. The first one is that it must be in writing and signed by our maker or drawer. It must contain an unconditional promise to pay a sum certain in money. Third, it must be payable on demand or at a fixed or determinable future time. Fourth, it must be payable to order or to better. And where the instrument is addressed to a drawee, it must be named or otherwise indicated therein with reasonable certainty. 
Okay, so let's consider the following illustration. It must be in writing and signed by the maker or drawer. In writing, so ba basically whether a promissory note or a bill of exchange, the foremost requirement is that it must be in writing. That's why it is impossible to have a verbal or an oral negotiable instrument because it says here it is in writing. And when we say in writing, is there a specific uh, type of paper where I can write it? Can I write it in a uh, piece of cloth or in a letter, in a parchment? Well, it does not matter as long as it is in writing. Is there a specific color of an ink that I need to make use in making or in preparing that instrument? None. The only requirement is that it is in writing. Okay, how about if you're engaged in that business of uh, preparing your wood carvings and then you will carve it there? I promise to pay, etc. Then that's still considered in writing. That's considered as substantial compliance of the provision on negotiable instruments, which is provided in section 10 of the negotiable instruments law, or what is known as the doctrine of substantial compliance. That it's not necessary to strictly adhere or follow the language of the law. It is enough if there has been substantial compliance to it. So next is that it should have been signed by our maker. If it is a promissory note, then it should be the maker who should sign it. But if it's a bill of exchange, then the same should have been signed by our drawer. In our illustration here, this is an example of a promissory note. Okay, so in writing, any medium can be used. If it is a promissory note, it should be signed by the maker. And our maker here is Mike. How about if it is a bill of exchange? Then the same should now be signed by our drawer. And the illustration, it has been signed by Danny. If it is a check, still it's signed by Danny. So Danny is the drawer. And if you notice, just like what I've been stressing to you a while ago, in a bill of exchange, our drawee is a natural person, whereas in Czech, the, the drawee is a bank, which is PNB in our illustration. So that's the first requirement. It is in writing, okay, and using any medium. And then it should have been signed by the party primarily liable. In a promissory note, we call him the maker. In a bill of exchange, it should have been signed by the person secondarily liable. And he's known as the drawer. And in this case, the name of the drawer is Danny. So what is a signature? Because it says here that it should have been signed by our maker. It should have been signed by our drawer. Well, signature refers to any kind of marking made by a person as long as he intends to be bound by the said mark, that can be considered a signature. Okay, so let's consider the following illustration of what is considered a signature. I promised to pay Peter or order one million, and then he placed, he wrote his name, Mike de la Serna, by writing his name on this portion. Then that is now considered signing. Any kind of mark. And then, instead of writing the full name Mike, he just made use of the letter M and then De La Serna. Still, that's considered a signature. Another example is this one. I hope you can see it. Only the initials M, D, C, Mike, De La Serna. Still, that's considered a signature. Also, in this situation, this is the signature that you all know of. Or, it could be this one. Okay? Dito, nakikita pa Paul Ryan. Don, wala na. Okay? This, these illustrations were copied from uh, the internet. So, I do not own these signatures. This sample of signatures. And then, it could even be a drawing of a dinosaur. Why? Because 
the definition of signature is that any kind of marking. That's why if you do not know how to write, but as long as you know how to draw, then that can be considered also as your signature. The location of the signature is immaterial. So it does not matter where your signature is situated. But ordinarily, our signature is found on the lower right-hand portion of the instrument. Look at the first illustration. And dito siya sa baba. But it does not matter if it will be found or located on the left-hand corner of the instrument. And the signature can even be incorporated in the body of the instrument. Take, for example, the following. I, blank, promise to pay Peter or order one million. And then, I am the holder of the instrument. For example, what did I do? On that blank space provided, I wrote my name, Paul Ryan. Okay? So, did I sign the instrument? The answer is yes. Because my act of placing my signature or my name on that blank space provided, that is now considered as if I have signed the instrument. Again, that's a reiteration of Section 10 of the Negotiable Instruments Law, the Doctrine of Substantial Compliance. That by placing your, your name on that blank space provided, that is now considered a substantial compliance of the rule which states that the instrument should have been signed. Number two. Okay, so the second requirement, the second requisite of negotiable instrument must contain an unconditional promise to pay a sum certain in money. So in this situation, you should have already read your sections two and three. Why is that? Because the unconditional promise in writing that is actually found in section three and then your sum certain in money that is actually found in section two. Remember, regardless of whether a promise or a note or a bill of exchange, there must be an unconditional promise or an unconditional order. And it should only be for the payment of a sum certain in money. The promise or the order must be unconditional. So what's the meaning of that? Unconditional means that it should not depend upon the happening of an event which may or may not happen. That sounds familiar to you, right? Because that is what we call a condition. Future and uncertain event. An event which may or may not happen. The promise to pay in a promissory note, the order to pay in a bill of exchange should not depend upon any condition. And you have also to remember that the promise or the order must be clear. If it is an order to pay, mere authority is not enough. I hereby authorize you, no, because it says here that there must be an order to pay. There is a command, there is a mandate, there is a directive. It's strong in character. You should not only be asking favor for the delivery of that payment if it is a bill of exchange. Okay? So let's consider some examples. Okay, so promissory note, unconditional promise that's found in section three, bill of exchange. Unconditional order, also in section 3, and then the promise to pay, which is a sum certain in money, and that's found now in your section 2. So the first thing that we have to consider is the unconditional promise or the unconditional order to pay. You have to remember that if it is a bill of exchange, mere authority is not sufficient. There must be a command to pay. There must be a directive to pay, a mandate to pay. Take, for example, I hereby authorize you to pay Peter or order one million. Is that enough in a bill of exchange? The answer is no. Because Darwin is simply asking or making Anton okay, or giving Anton the authority to pay. And that is not the command. That is not the order that you are expecting from Darwin. Thus, in this, in, in, in this example, 
this bill of exchange is regarded as non-negotiable and the reason given is that there is no unconditional order to pay. Mere request to pay is also not sufficient. Such as, such as in this illustration, please to let the bearer have one million and place to my account and you will oblige. That is just a request to pay. Okay, so again, this is non-negotiable. Please let the bearer have. Uh, nakikiusap ako, sige na, bigyan mo siya ng isang million. That is not the command to pay. Again, that there is no unconditional order to pay. Okay? This is not the command. This is not the mandate. This is not the directive to pay. Words of civility, however, will not affect the negotiable character of the instrument, such as the use of titles, attorney, CPA, ganon, doctor, Mr., Miss. They do not at all affect the negotiable character of the instrument, such as this one. I promise to pay Dr. Jack one million on demand and then signed attorney Andrew CPA. That is still a negotiable instrument. Okay? Words of civility or courtesy does not make it non-negotiable. Going on further, other discussions on unconditional promise or order to pay. Okay? So this is now a more detailed discussion on what is Section 3. Section 3 provides that the promise or order is said to be unconditional, although there is an indication of a particular fund out of which reimbursement is to be made, a particular account to be debited with the amount, or a statement of transaction which gives rise to the issuance of the instrument. But I want you to remember the last part, the last paragraph of Section 3, when it says that but an order or promise to pay out of a particular fund is not an conditional. Okay. I will first discuss the first two out of the paragraph A and then in relation to this third paragraph. Okay? Indication of a particular fund out of which reimbursement is to be made. In which case, that promise or uh, that order to pay is still considered as unconditional. But in the third paragraph, which likewise made mention about a particular fund, about a fund, but this fund now is a source of payment, okay? So to order or promise to pay out of a particular fund, that is already conditional. Remember, double negative. Negative plus negative equals positive. So not unconditional. In other words, if there is a particular fund as a source of payment, then that would now be conditional. Let's consider the following. Particular fund as a source of reimbursement. So there is a specific fund out of which reimbursement is to be made. Pay to Mike or order 1,000 pesos and reimburse yourself out of my money in your hands. In this, if there is a particular fund and that fund is considered as a source of reimbursement, Order to pay, such as in this case, is still considered as unconditional. Why? Okay, so pay to Mike or order 1,000 and reimburse yourself out of my money in your hands. Why is that? Because if ever Andrea, our drawee acceptor, will give or will deliver or will accede to the order or the command of Dimple to pay Mike, then Andrea will first pay Mike the amount of 1,000. And after paying Mike the amount of 1,000, that's the only time that Andrea will look the sufficiency or insufficiency of the funds in his possession. In other words, that fund in his possession will not be the direct source of payment. So whether sufficient or insufficient, there is actually an assurance that Mike would still receive the amount of 1,000 pesos. Okay, so the reason provided, the order is unconditional. There is actually an assurance that our payee Mike will receive the payment since the payment will first be given by Andrea to our payee. And after giving the 1,000, that's the only time that he will consider 
the sufficiency or insufficiency of the funds. Mas naunang nabayaran ang pay bago patingnan kung sapat ba o kulang yung pera na panggagal na na hinahawakan ni Andrea. So, take note. Ah, mali to. Only one step is involved. There are two steps involved. If there is a particular fund as a source of reimbursement, there are two steps involved. First step, for Andrea, our drawee acceptor, to deliver the payment to Mike. And after delivering the payment, that's now the second step, he will now, she will now consider how much is the fund in her possession. Bayaran mo muna bago mo tingnan ang payment. Bago mo tingnan ang pondo. So, si Mike nakatanggap na ng isang libo bago pa tingnan kung yung pondo na yun ay sapat ba o kulang na kabayaran ng isang libong piso. So, fund for reimbursement. Sabi niya dito, how? First, the drawee pays the pay from his own funds. From his own funds. So regardless of whether the fund mentioned is sufficient or insufficient, there is now an assurance that our pay will receive the amount involved. And after the drawee, he will now reimburse from the fund in his possession. So dito sa example natin kanina, balikan natin. Si Andrea, bayaran niya muna si Mike ng isang libo. Pagkatapos niyang naibigay yung isang libo kay Mike, sa kanya kukunin yung reimbursement doon sa pondo. So, yung pondo, hindi doon manggagaling ang pera na ibibigay kay Mike. Yung pondo lamang ang panggagalingan ng reimbursement ni Andrea. Si Andrea muna ang magpapaluwal ng pera. Si Andrea muna ang magbibigay ng pera kay Mike bago niya tingnan kung magkano ang pondo na kanyang hinahawakan. That makes it unconditional. Unconditional because the payment of Mike does not depend on the sufficiency or insufficiency or insufficiency of the fund in his possession. Kaya kahit pa kulang yung pondo na iyon para sa reimbursement ni Andrea, Mike has already received the full payment of that amount provided in that bill of exchange. Let's also consider this one. Particular fund as a source of payment. In particular fund as a source of payment, let's consider the following. Pay to Mike or order 1 million pesos. Ah, mali to. And reimburse. No. And, ah, out of my money in your hands. So, tanggalin nyo lang to. Sorry, mali to. Pay to Mike or order 1,000 pesos out of my money in your hands. Remove this phrase and reimburse yourself. Tanggalin nyo yan. Hindi na edit itong slide na to. Tanggalin ang and reimburse yourself. So, the instrument should be read as follows. Pay to Mike or order 1,000 pesos out of my money in your hands. Signed, Dimple to Andrea. So, that is now considered non-negotiable. Why? Because there is no more assurance that Mike could still receive the amount of 1,000. Why is that? Because the 1,000 will come from the fund which is in the possession of Andrea. If the fund is more than enough to cover the 1,000, then Mike can receive the 1,000. But if the fund is not enough to cover the 1,000, then Mike will no longer be able to receive the 1,000 pesos. In other words, the payment to Mike is dependent on the sufficiency or insufficiency of that money in the possession of Andrea. Example, kung ang pera na hinahawakan ni Andrea ay limang libo, that 5,000 is more than enough to cover the 1,000. So Mike can receive it. But how about if? That money in the possession, that fund in the possession of Andrea is only 500 pesos. 500 is not enough to cover the 1,000. So, matatanggap pa ba ni Mike yung 1,000? Hindi na. Again, that makes it now conditional. If you haven't analyzed it yet, kung hindi nyo pa napagtatanto hanggang sa oras na ito, kung ano yung tinatawag natin na conditional dyan, ang condition dito is the sufficiency or insufficiency 
of the fund. Kung kulang ang bayad, hindi ka mababa. Kung kulang ang pondo, hindi ka mababayaran. Pero kung sapat ang pondo, doon ka lang mababayaran if that particular fund is the direct source of payment. So the reason provided why it's considered as non-negotiable, it, it is conditional because the fund is now the direct source of payment and it may be sufficient or insufficient to cover the fund, to cover the amount. Kung sapat, that's the time that you will be paid. If it is insufficient, then you will never get paid. Okay? So this is the condition. The sufficiency which renders the order to pay conditional. Okay? So particular fund. Ito pala yung correct na illustration niya. I promise to pay under your order out of my share from our partnership profits. Where, what's the source of the 1 million? It is the It is the partnership profits that is also conditional bakit kasi yung partnership profit mo baka naman 100,000 lang it's not even enough to cover the 1 million di ba so that is considered conditional may or may not happen may or may not be sufficient that makes it conditional okay so again that is non, non negotiable because the promise to pay is dependent upon the sufficiency or insufficiency of dimple share in their partnership profits. If it is enough, then she would be able to pay Andrea the 1 million. If it is not enough, then she would no longer be able to pay Andrea of the amount of 1 million pesos. Okay, so funds for payment? Ito. There is only one step involved. Uh, yes, there is only one step involved. Ang gagawin lang ni Drowy, tingnan nyo dito. Ang gagawin lang ni Drowy, sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, yeah. Di ba, tang, sabi ko kanina, tanggalin nyo tong and reimburse yourselves. Okay. So, ang gagawin lang dito ni Dimple, gagawin, pay to micro order 1,000 out of my money in your hands. That should be the uh, slide. Tanggalin yung and reimburse yourself. Sign Dimple to Andrea. Ano lang ang gagawin ni Andrea bago niya bayaran si Mike? Titingnan lang niya. Magkano ba yung pera mo na pinahawak sa akin? One step lang. Tingnan ko muna ang pondo. Kung sapat, mababayaran ko si Mike. Kung kulang, hindi ko na siya babayaran. Unlike doon kanina, sa fund for reimbursement, pay to Mike or order, 1,000 and reimburse yourself out of my money in your hands. Ano ang gagawin ni Andrea? Bayaran niya muna si Mike. Pagkatapos niyang bayaran, sakalang niya titingnan. Magkano ba ang pondo? Sapat ba para sa reimbursement ko? Or kulang yung para sa reimbursement ko? Okay? Two steps for particular fund as a source of reimbursement. One step for particular fund as direct source of payment. Okay. So let's consider other illustrations on that particular fund, either as a source of reimbursement or a source of payment. So following. Pay to Mike or order, 1,000, out of my money in your hands. Is that negotiable? That's not negotiable. Why? Because the money in his hands is considered as, as a direct source of payment. The order to pay here is considered conditional. Saan ang condition? Ito yon, nakalagay sa red. If my money in your hands is sufficient. Kung sapat ba ang pera ko na yon. Okay? Mababayaran yon. If it is not enough, then Mike will no longer receive the 1,000. Okay? So, the obligation of the drawee to pay is dependent on the sufficiency or insufficiency of the fund. Going on further, other illustrations? How about if the amount is sufficient? Okay. Halimbawa dito, pay to Mike or order 1,000 out of my money in your hands. Eh, halimbawa, sapat naman pala eh. Ang pera pala niya doon is 1 million. 1,000. Eh, 1,000 lang yung babayaran. Eh, 1 million naman pala ang pondo. Will it now render our bill of exchange negotiable? So, how about if the amount is sufficient? 
How about if the person ordered to be paid is willing to pay even if the amount in his possession is insufficient? So ito yung mga bagay na tingnan natin dito. How about if the amount is sufficient? Kagaya nun kanina. Pay to Mike or order. 1,000. Out of my money in your hands. How about if it is enough? How about if the fund is 1 million? 1 million is more than enough to cover the 1,000. Is it still, is it now negotiable? Is it negotiable now? The answer is no. You are just too lucky that the fund is enough. That is a condition. May or may not happen. Sufficient or insufficient. That's why it's still considered non-negotiable. How about the second question? Second question, how about if the person ordered to pay is willing to pay even if the amount in his possession is insufficient? Going back to that illustration, pay to micro order 1,000 out of my money in your hands. Nung tiningnan ni Drowy kung magkano ang pondo, nakita niya isang daan lang pala, isang daang piso lang. 100 pesos is not enough to cover the 1,000 being ordered by the drawer for him to pay. Pero ano sinabi niya? 1,000 lang yan. Kayang-kaya ko yan. Bayaran ko na lang. Hmm? So the fund is not enough, but the drawee, the person being ordered to pay, is willing to shell out the payment. Will it now render our instrument negotiable because the drawee is willing to pay? The answer there is, it is still no. You again, if you are just too lucky that the drawee acceptor is willing to pay the instrument. So, what is the lesson here? The lesson here is that the negotiable character of the instrument does not depend on the willingness of the person to pay. It all depends on the language used in crafting that instrument. Even if the person is willing to pay, if the instrument was written or prepared in such a way that the payment depends on its sufficiency or insufficiency, the instrument is considered still a non-negotiable instrument. Let's consider the following. Anton was ordered by Darwin to pay Petra the amount of 1 million of the money of Darwin in Anton's possession. So Anton is the drawer. I'm sorry. Uh, Darwin is the drawer and then Anton is the drawee. And Petra is the uh, pay of the instrument. How much is to be paid? It is 1 million pesos. If you notice, sabi niya dito, to pay 1 million out of the money of Darwin in the possession of, uh, out, of Dar uh, out of the money of Darwin in the possession of Anton. So there is a fund and the fund now will be the direct source of payment. Okay, so there are some assumptions made here. For, first assumption is that the amount of such money in the possession of Darwin, okay, so the amount of fund is 11 million. 11 million is more than enough to cover the amount ordered to be paid. So, negotiable ba yung instrument natin? Parang ganyan. Ah, mali pala. So, is our instrument a negotiable instrument? The answer is no. Why? Petra was just lucky that the fund of Anton in the possession of Darwin is enough to cover the one million. Okay? But then again, that is still considered conditional because the payment depends upon a fund which may or may not be sufficient to cover the amount in that, on the face of that instrument. How about if, let us assume, that the fund in the possession of Darwin is only 100,000. It's not 11 million. However, sabi ni Darwin, okay lang yan. Kayang-kaya kung ilabas yung isang million, bayaran ko na lang. Saka na lang ako magpa-reimburse sa'yo. Again, that is also non-negotiable. Because, sabi natin, the negotiable character of the instrument does not depend upon the willingness of our drawee to pay. It depends upon the way by which you have prepared or crafted your bill of exchange. Other illustration. Pay to Petra or order 1 million and reimburse yourself out of my money in your hands. Take note. 
Sabi niya dito, reimburse. So, there is a fund and the fund is now considered a source of reimbursement. So, is it negotiable? So, assuming that the fund in the possession of Anton is 11 million, is it negotiable? So, pay to Petrol order 1 million and reimburse yourself out of my money in your hands. Is it negotiable? Oh, malito. The answer is yes. Supposed to be. It should be yes. Because it is a source of reimbursement. It is not a source of payment. But if that fund in the possession will now be considered the direct source of payment. So, alibawa, pay to Petrol order 1 million out of my money in your hands. Tanggalin mo ulit yung phrase na and reimburse yourself. And the fund is 11 million. Is it negotiable? Ito na nga yung tamang sagot niya. No. The order to pay is conditional. Petra was just lucky that the amount fund is sufficient to cover the amount to be paid. Kapag tanggalin mo yung reimburse yourself. Pero kung meron yung reimburse yourself, that instrument would still be considered to be negotiable. How about if the fund in the possession of Anton is lower than the amount being covered by Darwin to be paid? However, Anton is willing to pay Petra even if such fund is insufficient. Is it negotiable? If the instrument remains as follows, and pay to Petra or order 1 million and reimburse yourself, kung meron pa rin yung phrase na yan, and reimburse yourself, that is still negotiable. Pero kung tanggalin ko na tong phrase na and reimburse yourself, where the instrument now will uh, read, uh, be read as follows, pay to Petra or order 1 million out of my money in your hands. Tanggalin ko ulit yung phrase na and reimburse yourself. Tapos kulang pala yung pondo it's not enough to cover the 1 million. But uh, Anton here is willing to pay the 1 million despite the insufficiency of the fund. Then, the answer now would be no. Still no. Ito yung sinasabi natin kanina. The order to pay would still be conditional. So it, does, it depends upon the tenor of the instrument. It depends upon the language by which you have crafted or prepared your instrument. So if it has been crafted in a way that the payment depends upon a particular fund, the instrument would still be considered an unnegotiable instrument. Ulitin ko ah. Pay to Petra or order 1 million and reimburse yourself out of my money in your hands. Question number one, negotiable yan. Question number two, negotiable pa rin yan. Pero kung pay to Petra or order, out of my money in your hands. Tanggalin ko na yung phrase na and reimburse yourself. Question number one, non-negotiable na. Question number two, non-negotiable na. Kahit pa sapat yung pondo, non-negotiable. Kahit pa kulang ang pondo, kung willing siya na magbigay, still non-negotiable. Now, how about this one? Particular account to be debited with the amount. Particular account to be debited with the amount. So this is the second part of the uh, first paragraph of Section 3. An indication of a particular fund out of which reimbursement is to be made or a particular account to be debited with the amount. It says here that an instrument containing such stipulation will still be considered a negotiable instrument. Okay, Why? Because in this case, the instrument will still be paid first and after that, a particular account will just be debited. Okay. To debit means to deduct the amount okay, from a particular fund. Hence, payment is not subject on the sufficiency or insufficiency of the amount to be debited. Illustration, pay to Benor order uh, 1,000 pesos on account of contract between you and SLU. In this case, the instrument is considered still as negotiable because the order is not conditional notwithstanding the fact that a particular account to be debited has been indicated. Okay? 1,000 on account of the contract between you and SLU. So that would still be considered a negotiable instrument. How about this one? A statement of transaction. This is already our paragraph B. A statement of the transaction which gives rise to the issuance of the instrument will not render the instrument unnegotiable. Why? Because you are just giving a brief description of the reason or reasons why you are actually issuing the instrument. Okay, that's what we call a statement of the transaction. Example, I promise to pay Malu or order 200,000 pesos in payment of the card I bought from her last January 2, 2002. Sign Alexis. That is considered, non -nego that's considered negotiable. Negotiable. 
if you I promise to pay my lawyer order to 200,000 sign Alexis yung mga naka-block kung tigil ka lang diyan there's no question that is a negotiable instrument tama basic yun but if I will now include this phrase in payment of the car I bought from her last January to 2002 that is still perfectly negotiable why is that because this phrase in payment of the car I bought from her is just a description is just providing the reason why I am issuing the promissory note. Bakit ko binibigay yung, bakit ako nagpa-promise sa kanya na magbigay ng 200,000? Bakit? Kasi, bayad yun doon sa binili kong sasakin. And will, that will not at all affect the negotiable character of the instrument. If I will provide the reason or reasons why am I issuing that instrument, the instrument is still considered a negotiable instrument. Okay? Just here, the additional phrase, is just an indication of the reason for the issuance of the instrument. That is a statement of the transaction. But how about in this situation? I promise to pay malur order, 1,000, subject to the terms of the stipulations contained in the deed of sale, executed by us last January 2, 2002. So I promise to pay malur order, 1,000, sign Alexis. That is negotiable. Pero, dahil dinagdagan ko ito, sabi niya, subject to the terms and stipulate or subject to the terms or the stipulations contained in the deed of sale that will render now our instrument non-negotiable why because if you notice ang ginamit niyang salita subject so sinasabi doon depende doon sa ayan so the promise to pay was now made dependent upon the conditions found in the deed of sale that makes it now non-negotiable. Because the promise to pay is subject, it's made dependent upon conditions, upon terms provided in that deed of sale which they have entered into last January 2, 2002. That is why it's considered non-negotiable. You have to take note that under Section 10, yung sinasabi ko sa inyo kanina, the doctrine of substantial compliance, which provides that it's not necessary to strictly follow the language of the law. It is enough if you have substantially complied with the provisions thereof. Thus, the use of words of similar meaning will be sufficient. Anong ibig kong sabihin? That it's not always necessary that if ever you will enter into a contract, or into a promissory note or a bill of exchange, you will always be using the word pay to or you will always be using the word promise to pay. No. Words of similar meaning may be adapted. Kagaya doon sa promise to pay. Instead of using the word I promise to pay, I agree to pay, I will pay, I shall pay, good too. Yeah. Due to X on demand. Dito, kung due lang ang sinulat mo, wala yung on demand. Ah, that's not negotiable. Okay? Payable on demand. Okay? That's also considered or synonymous to promise to pay. Okay? Ito naman yung mga kwan. O due to, it's not synonymous already to promise to pay. I acknowledge. Okay? I owe you. Typical yan doon sa, sa mga accountants. I owe you. May utang ako sa'yo. Sinabi ko bang babayaran ko? Ayan, di ba? Uh, may utang ako. Hindi ko naman sinabi kung kailan ko babayaran. Pero halimbawa sinabi ko ganito, I owe you 1 million to be paid on. Yeah, to be paid on. Is that already negotiable? Yes, it's now negotiable. Kasi nga, I owe you acknowledgement that I am indebted. May utang ako. Inacknowledge ko yun. I recognize it. Tapos sinabi ko bang babayaran ko? Oo naman. Nung sinabi ko na, to be paid on demand. Yeah. To be paid on demand. That is, that is now the promise to pay. And when will, when will I deliver the payment? On demand. Okay, so yun. Let's consider the following exercises on negotiable or non-negotiable. Specifically only on the topics about unconditional promise or order to pay. Okay, so pay to Alex or order 1,000 out of my salary from SLU. What's your answer? Negotiable or non-negotiable? That is non-negotiable. Why non-negotiable? Because there is a fund and the fund is the direct source of payment out of my salary from SLU. Okay? I promise to pay below order 100,000 out of the proceeds of my uh, proceeds of the mortgage loan. Still, that is considered non-negotiable because the fund is considered as the direct source of payment. Next, I promise to pay one uh, 10,000 pesos out of my salary from SLU and the proceeds from the sale of my car. What? How is that? Notice? 
out of, sabi niya. So, that is a fund as a source of payment. Correct? So, I promise to pay 10,000 pesos out of my salary from SLU and the proceeds from the sale of my car. But, merong twist. Ano yung twist? There are now two sources of payment. First is my salary from SLU. And the second source would now be the proceeds from the sale of my car. Is that negotiable or non-negotiable? Let's go back to the last paragraph of Section 3. Promise to pay or order out of a particular fund is not unconditional. Yun ang sinabi nun. Specific. Promise or order to pay out of a particular fund. A fund. A specific fund. Which means that the prohibition applies only if there is a single fund and the fund is the direct source of payment. So, ano yung pinagsasabi ko? Ibig kong sabihin, if there is a fund, but as a source of payment, and the fund is not only limited to a single fund, kagaya dito sa example natin, dalawa na ang sources natin, then that will be considered already a negotiable instrument. Why? Because what is prohibited only under the last paragraph of Section 3 is that having a single fund as the direct source of payment. But in our example here, there will now be Two sources of our payments. Salary from SLU and proceeds from the sale of the car. That is why that is now considered a negotiable instrument. Third, a fourth, pay to Malora Order 1,000 out of my part of the estate. That is still non-negotiable. Out of my part of the estate, that is considered non-negotiable. Even if it is enough to cover the 1,000, it does not matter. Because the instrument has been crafted in a way that the payment is limited only to a single source. And that source may or may not be sufficient to cover the amount directed or ordered to be paid. The fifth one, good to Peter or order, one million. Did you notice? There is no promise to pay. But ano sinabi naan kanina? The word good is synonymous with the promise to pay. So that is still considered a negotiable instrument. Hold then for Peter or better. One million. Hold then. Wala namang sinabi na, na, na promise. Wala namang sinabi na pay to. But still, that is considered a negotiable instrument. Due to X or order, 1,000 payable on demand. Due to X. Acknowledgement, right? But there is this inclusion of the phrase payable on demand. That's why that is still considered a negotiable instrument. There is still a promise to pay. And it is unconditional. I do acknowledge myself to be indebted to X or order in the sum of 1,000 to be paid on demand. Yeah. That is negotiable. But I do acknowledge myself to be indebted to X or order in the sum of 1,000. Kung iyan lang, wala yung phrase na to be paid on demand. That is non-negotiable. Pero dahil dinagdagan ko ng to be paid on demand, that is now considered negotiable. Why? Because the inclusion of this phrase to be paid on demand means that there is now an unconditional promise to pay. So that is our last discussion pertaining to payable on demand. I'm sorry, payable to uh, uh, order to pay or promise to pay. Next part of our discussion will be some certain in money. That will be covered by uh, another recording, okay, which will be posted later. Thank you.